Hello there. I'm Nate Hovey, and welcome to another adventure. Today, I've got quite the tour mapped out for you. Over the last year and a half, I've been living here in Pampanga, an absolutely beautiful region of the Philippines, just north of the capital Manila. Now, this specific area behind me is Clark. It's a true gem of a destination on this island, one that is steeped in many layers of history. Here in the 21st century, Clark is considered to be one of the most promising areas for future development, innovation, and investment in the entire country. However, in my own explorations throughout this place, I've come to discover treasures of a past full of stories. Now, rather than simply talking about it, how about I take you with me and show you around? Come on. First, a bit of background. Well over a hundred years ago, the Philippines was an extension of the Spanish Empire. It had been under Spanish rule since the 1500s. Around the time that Filipinos were uniting to oust the Spaniards and declare independence in the late 1800s, the United States and Spain went to war. The American victory in 1898 and the subsequent signing of the Treaty of Paris suddenly shifted control of Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines to the United States. The following year, American forces cracked down on the first Philippine Republic's refusal to accept this authority swap, and the three-year Philippine-American War ensued. By the summer of 1902, the American army had defeated Philippine Revolution forces. The United States then established an extensive military stronghold and binational governance across the Philippine Islands. It wasn't until 1946, with the signing of the Treaty of Manila, that the Philippines officially gained full independence from the United States. After 48 years of American sovereignty, the people of the Philippines assume the status of an independent nation. The transfer is made on the 4th of July, a day full of significance for these Yanks. A special basis agreement between the USA and the Philippines, however, allowed American forces to maintain a presence on Philippine soil up until the early 1990s. With the final withdrawal of American military personnel from these islands in November 1992, for the first time in over 400 years, the Philippines had no foreign power on their land. This area, known today as Clark, started out as a stronghold for the U.S. Army in 1902. Named after a U.S. colonel who died in the Philippine-American War, Fort Stotzenberg was officially established here by President Theodore Roosevelt in 1903. Although these posts were buried by the Japanese during the World War II occupation, and later uncovered and moved on several occasions, they are original. Further behind me is the parade ground, a wide open centerpiece of the old base. It offers views of the mountains to the west, and even has a padded jogging track that goes all the way around. Similar to many other American military bases, there are designated plots of land allocated for residential and administrative purposes. These buildings, for example, sit on one end of the parade ground. Here, Building 2125 was completed in 1913 and housed a canteen, gymnasium, post office, and even a theater. It later became the headquarters of the 13th U.S. Air Force. Just across the street, Building 2127 originally went up as barracks for cavalry and field artillery personnel. Constructed in 1914, this is the former Telephone Operations Office for Fort Stotzenberg. It actually sustained damage during World War II raids. Speaking of the Second World War, when Japanese forces conquered the Philippines and took control of the space, they used many of these and other buildings around the parade ground as their own offices and residential units. For instance, building 2122, just behind me, was used by Japanese forces during the occupation period by their own high-ranking officers. After World War II, it was converted into offices for the commander of the 13th U.S. Air Force. Interestingly enough, this originally served as a four-lane bowling alley I wonder if there are any pins still locked away somewhere inside. Today, 
These historic structures serve as the headquarters for the Clark Development Corporation, or CDC. They are the ones tasked with maintaining and redeveloping a lot of the buildings and land left behind by the Americans in the 90s. Okay, let's head over to the barn houses. One long stretch along the parade ground is the former Officer's Row, right here. This really is like stepping back in time. There are almost identical homes lined up with gardens, lawns, and a sidewalk in front connecting them all. Now, these homes on Officer's Row were built in 1903 and, as the name implies, housed a number of Army officers and their families. I should mention that these acacia trees were planted around the same time. They'll be turning 120 years old soon. The 17 barn houses, as they're now called, have been touted as one of the best examples, still intact, of American military tropical architecture. The design allows for breezes to flow both underneath the raised flooring and through the wide verandas in front. On top of that, the steep metal roof reflects harsh sunlight, thus reducing heat absorption, and it's ideal for rain runoff, especially in this type of tropical climate. Oh, so take a look at this. The wood for the floorboards is actually Oregon pine. It was imported here from my home state long before I was born. Pretty wild. Like so many buildings here in Clark, these barn houses have been repurposed over several decades. They have served as airline offices, churches, restaurants, fitness centers, and a daycare center. This barn house is now a popular cafe with some delectable desserts, I might add. It's neat because inside you can find old memorabilia, photographs, and little bits here and there that pay homage to the historical significance of this place. This is a photo of the infamous Mount Pinatubo eruption, the largest volcanic eruption globally in the last 100 years. Now, Clark sits only about 16 kilometers or 10 miles away from Mount Pinatubo. And when it blew in June of 1991, it all but decimated the space and the communities around it. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Also on the perimeter of the parade grounds is the Clark Museum which contains exhibits, a 40 cinema, and loads of information about what I'm showing you today, and plenty more. Unfortunately, they are closed until further notice, so I won't be able to take you inside. But I can show you some of the really cool artifacts that are right out here. Present day Clark is a freeboard zone essentially divided into three sections. Clark International Airport, which is behind me, Clark Air Base, and CDC managed properties for businesses, investors, and residents. You'll notice that Old Clark and New Clark are very much mixed all over the place, creating kind of a unique time warp when driving around. Here we are on Clark Air Base, now controlled by the Philippine Air Force. In many ways, it still looks like it used to over half a century ago. As an extension to Fort Stotzenberg, the United States Army Air Corps built their first runway here in 1919, and it was given the name Clark Field after Major Harold Clark, an American aviator who died that same year and was buried in Arlington National Cemetery in Washington, D.C. Clark Field and Fort Stotzenberg collectively became Clark Air Base in 1949 when it was handed over to the newly established United States Air Force. Clark served as a strategic logistical hub and supply base during the Korean and Vietnam Wars that followed. In this collection of historic aircraft, you come across this well-known helicopter, the UH-1H Huey, which played a major role in Vietnam. 
Quite a few aircraft types on display here were used by both the United States and Philippine military forces over the years. Now check this out. This is the Northrop F-5 Freedom Fighter supersonic jet. It was the iconic performer of the Blue Diamonds, an aerial aerobatic team that remained active here in the Philippines until 2005. Both the Blue Diamonds and the U.S. Navy's Blue Angels were formed in the mid-1900s. Please excuse me if I'm sweating a lot. It is very hot and humid out here. A typical Southeast Asian tropical climate. This, by the way, is the old bamboo bowl, a sports field built on base in 1955. Apart from hosting social and sporting events, this place also served as a temporary tent city and transfer point for thousands of refugees from Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia near the end of the Vietnam War. After the Challenger space shuttle disaster in 1986, the military renamed the field to honor the fallen American astronauts. And today, it still bears the name Challenger Field. So this has to be one of the most fascinating spots in Clark, simply because it's so apocalyptic. Completed in 1964, this was the U.S. Air Force Regional Medical Center. Apparently at the time, it was one of the most renowned and well-equipped hospitals in this part of Southeast Asia. It had approximately 200 beds and offered everything from mental health and dental clinics to 24-hour emergency care facilities. There was a time when the outpatient clinics here reported treating more than 17,000 patients per month. It was also here that many prisoners of war from Vietnam were brought and treated by both American medical staff and Filipino residents in training. This complex also had an office for veterinary medicine, which helped keep the health of sentry dogs in check on the base. This place has been abandoned ever since the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in 1991. Just by looking around, you can tell that this facility was huge. Within months of the US military abandoning the base, Plenty of looters came in and took pretty much whatever was left. Now you could say the building is down to the bare bones. Just graffiti on the walls, crumbling columns, and water leaking down from the floors above. You have a courtyard right here, which I'm sure was beautiful back in the day, but it's just very interesting to see a skeleton of a building like this. Check this out. So these are the old elevator shafts right here. And if you look at this one, there's still an elevator just sitting here on its side. There's rust everywhere, it's bent right here, but you have the wheel and the cables that are still there. I think this is really cool. These circles right here, you can actually find in the photos from the 60s and 70s. It was one of the prominent architectural features of the hospital. I think it really fits in that time period, if you ask me. As you might imagine, with such history and what's physically left of it, this building is considered to be one of the most haunted in the Philippines. Ghost Hunters International actually came here and did an episode that aired in 2009. And it doesn't surprise me, going through these dark and spooky rooms, I can tell you this, I would not want to be here at night. This is what I'm talking about with the spookiness of this place. 
I'm on the lower level of the hospital, and you have this long, dark corridor right here. You hear the echoes in here, and I can also hear bats, birds. I mean, I don't think I'd want to go down that right now. It's just muddy, dark, water everywhere. Yeah, I don't think so. I can explore other places. Interesting side note here. During the filming of the Chuck Norris film, Delta Force Two in 1989, one of the helicopters involved in that production crashed here on the island, killing four people on board and severely injuring four others. The injured were brought here to this hospital and treated and although Chuck Norris wasn't on board that chopper, he came here to check on members of his team. Unfortunately, one of the four injured died not long after arriving. The hospital included a number of sections scattered around the complex. This area was for the mental health clinic. Not much is left now except for the crumbling structure itself. One of the building numbers just outside. This really does make you think of an abandoned government project in the jungle. I mean, nature has really taken over pretty much all around. And these covered walkways, they're still mostly intact, kind of weaving throughout the complex. You have to imagine that back in the day, this had to be one of the busiest areas on the base. Now, only memories and an empty shell of a hospital remain. I'm going to step back a little further in time, several decades before that medical center existed. Hours after the infamous attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese on the morning of December 7, 1941, Japanese forces proceeded to conduct air raids further across the Pacific. At 12.30 p.m. local time, while American aircraft were still on the ground being prepped for a counterattack, the Japanese 11th Air Fleet commenced an hour-long attack above Clark Field, just 10 and a half hours after the strike at Pearl Harbor. Over 630 bombs were dropped over Clark, destroying dozens of American B-17s and P-40 fighters. This and other raids at surrounding bases wiped out nearly half of the U.S. Army's aircraft in the Philippines, severely crippling firepower in East Asia. Japanese forces quickly plowed across the islands and took full control of the Philippines in the spring of 1942. It wasn't until January 1945 that the U.S. Army retook Clark Field and gained a stronghold that would help drive Japan to unconditional surrender in September of that year. The war in this region came at a significant cost. Estimates put the number of lives lost at over 10,000 Americans, 255,000 Japanese, and more than half a million Filipinos. I'm standing at the location of a former airstrip called Kamikaze West Airfield, just north of the main airport. Although it's not much today, it turns out that the very first designated group of Japanese kamikaze pilots took off from this airfield in October of 1944, well ahead of the infamous suicidal raids that sank or damaged hundreds of U.S. ships the following year. It was here that Japanese soldiers carved out a tunnel under this hill for Commander Tamai Asaichi and his kamikaze pilots. The tunnel served as a safety bunker during American air raids. Today, the tunnel entrance is still there, but hidden by layers of overgrown vegetation. Take a look at this. Just down the road from West Airfield is a vast collection of earth-covered munition bunkers, collectively called the bomb dump back in the day. They are mostly abandoned now and sit out here in this field, thus allowing time to only heighten the mystery of this place.
Here is one of the few places left in the Philippines where the United States flag continues to fly. This is Clark Veteran Cemetery. Approximately 9,000 Filipino and American soldiers, their families, and other civilians are buried here. Over 2,000 graves are those of unknown soldiers. The earliest burials date back to the Philippine-American War 120 years ago. After World War II, a number of American bases on the island repositioned graves of their non-World War II dead and sent them to this cemetery in Clark. Those who had perished in the Second World War, some 17,000, were buried together in Manila American Cemetery to the south. Today, this cemetery is managed by American Battle Monuments Commission, a United States agency that oversees nearly 50 memorial properties and markers in 15 countries. When the Japanese conquered the islands in 1942, they forced nearly 75,000 American and Filipino prisoners of war to walk nearly 66 miles, or over 100 kilometers, from Bataan Peninsula in the south to a concentration camp at Camp O'Donnell to the north. This was in addition to a train journey in which prisoners were forced 100 at a time into small boxcars. This horrific journey became known as the Bataan Death March and the road right here in front of Clark Veterans Cemetery was part of the route that they took. The Japanese soldiers abused, shot, buried alive, and beheaded several thousand Filipinos and Americans en route. No clear records exist, but it is estimated that for those who survived and made it to the prison camps, some 25,000 Filipino soldiers and 6,000 Americans later died of starvation, disease, and other causes. In total, 30% of American military personnel captured in Bataan never returned home. At the location of one of the O'Donnell prison camps, Kapas National Shrine now stands as an expansive memorial to those who faced the horrors of the Bataan Death March. 31,000 trees are planted here to symbolize the estimated death toll within the concentration camps. Just to the south, Another memorial depicts scenes of helpless prisoners at the hands of the Japanese Imperial Army during the Death March. Back at Clark, while there were certainly times of immense tragedy from years of war, there were decades of life, peace, and growth on the base. This arch in the shape of a traditional Salakat hat welcomed soldiers and civilians at Clark's front gate. It served as a symbol of peaceful cooperation between the United States and the Philippines. Here is the old Wagner Middle School, where American children attended classes while their parents worked on base. Next door is Wagner High School. These complexes now serve as government offices and an aviation training center. Down the road and a few turns away, there's a canine cemetery, likely the only one of its kind in the country. Over 280 U.S. Air Force military dogs are buried here, with their names and identification numbers written on narrow tombstones. It brings a smile reading some of the affectionate pet names in the mix. In the 70s and 80s, there were well over 120 dogs working alongside teams of handlers to guard the base, sniff out potential bombs, and detect illegal drugs. Fortunately, this area remains protected from future development here in Clark. I'm walking through a house that once served as the home for officers and their families as far back as the late 1950s. In a number of ways, residential units like this followed the design of typical American homes of that period. This neighborhood, known as the Hill Housing Area, once had large sidewalks, parks, and neatly organized roads and properties. Today, it might as well be a long lost village in the jungle. What makes it even more surreal is the fact that there's a gigantic modern water park right next door. How crazy is that? This just provides a great example of what Clark is nowadays, a collage of history and modern development with hidden treasures of a past nearly forgotten.
I mentioned earlier that a once-in-a-century volcanic eruption changed everything. From where I'm standing now just outside the east perimeter of Clark, you can reach the crater of Mount Pinatubo by following the Sokobia River below. Before it violently erupted in June of 1991, scientists from the U.S. Geological Survey responded to early warning signs and came to Clark Air Base. They worked alongside Filipino volcanologists to try to understand and predict when Pinatubo would blow. Studies pointed to an inevitable catastrophe. On June 10th, the Secretary of Defense ordered a mass evacuation of nearly 15,000 people stationed at Clark. The government of the Philippines coordinated their own evacuation of almost one million civilians surrounding the mountain. Days later, on the morning of June 15th, Mount Pinatubo violently erupted with the energy of 200,000 atomic bombs, spewing millions of tons of ash and poisonous gas miles high. Superheated pyroclastic flows raced down Pinatubo slopes and reached the gates of the base. The weather changes very quickly here in the Philippines, and that is exactly what happened when Mount Pinatubo erupted. As a terrible coincidence of Mother Nature, Typhoon Yunya hit the Philippines at the height of the eruptions, turning it into a megastorm of lightning, wind, mud, and rain. Countless buildings collapsed under the weight of mud raining from the sky. Deadly mud flows of volcanic debris, known as lahars, like this one, swept through this valley and others flooding low-lying communities throughout the region. Although 722 people tragically died as a result of Mount Pinatubo, it is estimated by the USGS that over 5,000 lives were saved thanks to early detection, warnings, and evacuations. Mount Pinatubo's eruption destroyed most of Clark Air Base. Surveys conducted afterward revealed that over 340 buildings had completely collapsed or sustained significant damage. Hundreds more required extensive cleanup and mud removal. The United States government decided to leave Clark altogether that same year, officially handing over what was left of the base to the Filipino government on November 26, 1991. After the departure of the American military, Clark was repeatedly looted and left abandoned for years. In the last few decades, Clark's Air Base, International Airport, and Freeport Zone have undergone a tremendous transformation, with heavy investment coming from the government and private investors. Where troops once prepared for war in the Pacific, call centers, fast food restaurants, resorts, luxury apartment buildings, golf courses, and a state-of-the-art airport terminal are popping up here in Clark. A new chapter is being written for what was once the largest American base overseas. All that was left behind continues to hold a special place in the hearts of many Filipino and American veterans who once called Clark home. I have truly enjoyed discovering the rich history and stories that Clark Air Base holds, and I hope you have too. If you would like to learn more or plan your own visit to Clark, be sure to check out the description below for details. From the beautiful island of Luzon, I wish you and your loved ones many happy trails ahead. I'll see you again soon.